Howdy again everyone. I've been very neglectful recently. Back in 2018, Sigma released this rather extreme zoom lens and I haven't actually tested it yet. Well, let's fix that negligence right now. It's the Sigma 60-600mm f4.5-6.3 DG OS HSM Sports Lens. What a monster in size and title. I'd like to thank Sigma UK for loaning me a copy of this lens for a few weeks for testing, and with its extreme nature, it did take about that long. As usual though, this is a totally independent review where I'll be looking at both its strengths and weaknesses. It's for full frame digital SLR cameras, although it can be adapted onto mirrorless cameras very easily, and I'll be testing it out on my new Canon EOS R5, although the lens is available on other camera mounts. At 1600 US dollars and about 1600 pounds in the UK, it's a pretty expensive option for you, but if it performs well, then it could be quite a spectacular, not to mention enjoyable, workhorse for almost anyone in all kinds of situations. That 10x zoom range, ending in a massive 600mm, is absolutely incredible, giving this lens a huge variety of uses, particularly it's a wildlife photographer's dream. 60mm is hardly a wide angle, but it does give you quite a good view for the bigger picture before you zoom in. Aside from anything else, you can always start by zooming out to 60mm and looking around your landscape for an interesting subject to shoot, a bird or an animal or whatever, and then zoom right into whatever it is. Fun and really useful. This could be the ultimate safari or bird watching lens for the more affluent shooter. If you haven't picked up what I'm trying to say here, that zoom range is amazingly fun. In order to keep the lens's size and price to a reasonable level, its maximum aperture is a relatively narrow f4.5 at a wide angle end, and f6.3 as you zoom in, so you'll often want to use fairly high ISO levels on your camera. But the lens does come with image stabilisation to help you get sharper images at long focal lengths, a vitally important feature on a lens like this. Here's some for digit 600mm with the image stabilisation turned off, and now turned on to mode 1. Now the internal image stabilisation of my Canon EOS R5 camera is helping out here, but only a little. I tested the lens on my old Canon 6D and got about the same, very good level of stabilisation. This is actually a really impressive result, one of the best I've seen on a 600mm optic. Here's some footage in mode 2, which is designed for panning. You can further tweak the image stabilisation settings if you use a Sigma USB lens dock, and Sigma recommends that you turn image stabilisation off when shooting with a tripod to stop your image drifting around. Now let's look at its build quality. Sigma have launched similar lenses before of a 50 to 500 mm focal length, and while they've had good build quality, this 60 to 600 mm sports lens feels like a step above. Quite a luxury product, well built and looking the business. And aside from anything else, it's certainly big and heavy, weighing 2.7 kilograms. The lens is based on a metal mount, unsurprisingly, with a generous weather sealing gasket around the edge. Then there comes a very heavy duty tripod mount, which is not removable, although it can easily be turned to shoot in portrait orientation. The lens's manual focus ring is broad and rubberized, and turns quite smoothly and precisely. Another piece of good news is that the lens doesn't really seem to exhibit any focus breathing, the lens doesn't zoom in and out as you change focus. The lens also has an ultrasonic autofocus motor that works accurately and quietly, producing only a quiet whooshing sound. It also works quickly, whether you're zoomed out to 60mm or in to 600. The lens's zoom ring is rubberized. It turns quite far, and it's lockable at certain points, which is just as well as it's rather prone to zoom creeping, collapsing under its own weight if you hold the lens upright or downwards. Another issue is that the zoom ring is rather sticky. If you're dreaming of getting slow zoom shots while shooting video, then you should forget that right away. Some good points though are that the lens is easy to zoom in and out by pushing and pulling, if that's what you're into. And also, the lens appears to be par focal, keeping its focal length in place as you zoom in and out. The very front edge of the lens is rubberized for impact protection. The front filter size is a very large 105mm wide, so filters will cost you a lot of money. 
The lens also comes with a large hood which needs to be tightened in place and you also get a good quality carry bag. Overall, top marks for build quality and electronics here, although I do wish the zoom ring turned a little more smoothly for video work. Anyway, let's get on and look at image quality now. I'll start by testing it on a full frame camera. I've adapted it here onto my 45 megapixel Canon EOS R5, a very challenging camera sensor. In-camera corrections are turned on. Starting at 60mm and f4.5, image quality in the middle of the picture is pretty sharp, and contrast is pretty good too. Image quality in the corners is a bit softer. Stop down to f5.6 and the corners are about the same, but there's an extra little edge of sharpness back in the middle. At f8, picture quality in the middle is perfect. The corners are still just okay, but stop down to f11 for a minuscule improvement there again. Let's zoom in a bit now to 150mm, where the maximum aperture has now darkened to f5.6. It's the same situation in the middle of your images, they're very sharp from the maximum aperture and get a touch better when stopped down. Over in the corners, image quality is a tiny bit better than it was at 60mm, although still a little softer than the middle. Stop down to f8 for a little extra sharpness, but that's about as sharp as the lens gets at 150mm. Let's zoom in a little further now to 400mm. Again, I can tell you it's exactly the same situation in the middle of your images, very sharp from the maximum aperture of f6.3 and getting just a touch sharper as you stop down to f8. Let's look over in the corners. Even from f6.3 they're reasonably sharp actually, not perfect but still pretty nice. Stopping down to f8 or f11 doesn't really make any difference in those corners though. And finally, let's zoom all the way into 600mm. At f6.3, sharpness in the middle of your image is still quite good. Not perfect, but still pretty impressive for a 45 megapixel sensor. The corner image quality looks okay too. Not very sharp, but clear enough with good contrast. Stop down to f8 for a noticeable improvement in those image corners and a more striking improvement back in the middle, where image quality has become excellent. F11 looks about the same in the middle and back in the corners, so really that's about as sharp as the lens gets at 600mm. So overall, on a full frame camera, the lens's image quality is pleasingly consistent. Its sharpness at its widest apertures is always very good, especially considering the high resolution camera I'm shooting on here, and you can always top down to f8 or so for some very impressive sharpness. For a lens with a 10x zoom range ending at 600mm, that's pretty remarkable. In fact, I found it was just a tiny bit sharper than the older Sigma 150-600mm contemporary lens that I tested a while ago, despite the longer zoom range. Well, admittedly, the 60-600mm lens costs a lot more, so you're getting what you pay for here. Alright, those were the results on a full frame camera. Let's test it on APS-C now by fixing it onto my Canon EOS M6 Mark II with its unbelievably challenging 32.5 megapixel sensor. Very few camera lenses are really sharp enough for this sensor. We'll start at 60mm and f4.5 where in the middle of the image picture quality is actually ok, fairly sharp. The image corners are a bit softer. Stop down to f5.6 for a slightly sharper image in the corners and a very sharp image in the middle and stop down to f8 and it gets even a little better. The image corners look quite good now at f8 also, so that's a good start at 60mm. Let's zoom in a bit to 150mm, it's about the same situation as at 60mm. Picture quality in the middle is just good at a widest aperture of f5.6 and corner image quality just ok, but stop down to f8 for a major improvement in the corners which look nice and sharp now and the middle looks very impressive. Stopping down to f11 or darker does not make a further improvement. Let's zoom in again to 400mm now. The maximum aperture has now darkened to f6.3 where sharpness in the middle is quite good. The corners look just a tiny bit softer. Stop down to f8 for a minuscule improvement in contrast over in the corners and back in the middle too. Stopping down to f11 or darker doesn't make any improvement. And finally, let's zoom all the way into 600mm. Image quality in the middle is a bit soft now and the corners look a little softer again. Stop down to f8 for a tiny improvement in contrast in the corners and a bit more sharpness in the middle too. 
Again, stopping down further doesn't improve anything. Overall, if you bear in mind the brutality of the 32.5 megapixel sensor I'm testing it on, the lens does reasonably well on an APS-C camera, and on a 24 megapixel camera it'll be pretty nice. Stopping down to f8 will help you a lot at pretty much every focal length. Phew, what a lot of testing. Well, let's move on and look at distortion and vignetting on a full frame camera. These images are taken without any corrections. At 60mm, we get a little barrel distortion here, and at f4.5, a little vignetting in the corners. That vignetting slowly reduces as you stop down to f5.6 and f8. If you zoom in to 150mm, then that barrel distortion flips into mild pincushion distortion, which sticks around as you zoom all the way into 600mm. As you zoom in more, vignetting slowly increases and is fairly noticeable at f6.3. Stop down to f8 or f11 to see that vignetting gone. Overall, for a lens with a 10 times zoom range, that's quite a moderate performance really. Alright, let's take a look at close-up image quality now. Don't zoom all the way into 600mm for your pictures of smaller subjects. The best magnification can be found at 200mm, where you can get surprisingly close to your subject. At f5.6, close-up image quality is a bit soft. Stop down to f8 for a bit more sharpness and contrast, and at f11, a little more again. Ok, let's see how the lens performs against bright lights now. At the widest angle of 60mm, we see quite a few tidbits of flaring floating around, but contrast remains fairly high. If you zoom in, then bright lights only cause a serious problem when your light is right there in the picture, so again, that's a reasonably good showing. And finally, bokeh. The lens does not have a very bright maximum aperture, but at these telephoto focal lengths, you can get some really out of focus backgrounds here. Like most telephoto lenses, we don't see any bokeh problems at all. Those out of focus backgrounds look lovely and smooth, just about all of the time. So then, overall, the Sigma 60-600mm lens, considering its huge zoom range, is a very good performer. Its images are pretty sharp throughout the zoom range, and very sharp when stopped down to f8, even on some pretty high resolution cameras. It's big and quite heavy, but its build quality, autofocus and image stabilisation are all really excellent, making it really enjoyable to use overall. It's definitely quite an expensive lens, a bit flashy. I can easily imagine rich people sitting in their drawing rooms in their evening jackets, night after night, drinking cognac and smoking cigars, with a Canon EOS R5 lying in their lap, this lens attached to it, just laughing away to themselves. Well, I'm no socialist, so I say good on them, and even for the hoi polloi like me who would have to save up for this lens for at least a year or so, it's still an absolute blast, so it has to come highly recommended.